Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back. Uh, my family and ex- uh, extended family, we were gone last week. We were in South Dakota. Um, <laughs> all, my, all my South Dakota people, uh, <laughs> both of them. Um, it's like the amount of trees there. Um, but we had a great time. Uh, my mom's side of the family is from a little town called Leola in north central South Dakota. And it's just amazing up there. Um, we, you know, we would go there many, many times uh, as children, sometimes for long stints of time, and so many great memories. So it's good to be with family, uh, but it's good to be with family. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord and back home. So it's a good, it's a good break, but I'm glad I live in a town that's just a little bit bigger than a blink of an eye. So love you, Uncle Colin, not Mary Beth. Um, but last week, you know, we had uh, uh, 740 last Saturday, not, this, not yesterday, but a week ago. Do we have that picture? We had a knife winner. Ryan Shiel. You know, 740 is just a great time to get together as men of God and, and really be men. You know, I forget what the verse is, but Paul says, I think it's in Corinthians, stand strong, act like men. Amen? Stand firm, act like men. And I think, you know, when we have healthy men, we can create healthy families. When we have healthy families, we have healthy communities. And when we have healthy communities, we have a healthy nation. Uh, All for the glory of God. Amen? So, and, you know, it's, it takes, it takes two to tango, but when the man can lead the way and step up and lead in the love, sacrificial love of Christ, it is so significant. So, uh, it's a great time every month. And last week, we had Jason Niemeyer brought a great word. Could we just give him a thanks this morning? Great word. Jason and Cassie have been so faithful with uh, Summit Youth, and, and now Jason is our worship director, um, just doing a fantastic job, uh, really dove into the word and talked about the advocate. Um, you know, we're in our series called Keep in Mind. Um, but he went through how we have an advocate. You know, we're not meant to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Amen? We need his presence. We need his power. Um, you want to put that up? Keep in mind. Um, we need his presence and his power in our lives. Um, you know, we cannot do it on our own strength. Right? God, and let me say that again. We cannot live the Christian life on our own strength. <clears throat> Galatians and, and Romans say both very similar things, uh, and I think Galatians says it very specifically, no flesh can be justified by the law. We need the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We need his leading. We need his guiding. We need his transformative work. We need to be born again. We're not born of the will of man. You can't be good enough, try hard enough, to get a gift we can't afford and that we don't deserve, right? We need the Holy Spirit's transformative work, and then we need the advocate who is our helper. The Greek word is paraclete. And just like Jason talked about last week, it's one who comes alongside of us to help. That's who God is. He has has chosen to to send His Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, to make our hearts His home. You know, um, John chapter 4 talks about how Jesus was talking to the Samaritan, and He told her there's coming a time that you will, it doesn't matter what, if you worship on this mountain or that mountain, but all of, all of those who worship the Father will worship in spirit and in truth. So it's not where the temple is, it's that God makes us his temple. Amen? And that is by the indwelling and power of the Holy Spirit. And then talked about how the Holy Spirit testifies and convicts. Aren't you glad it's not our job to save people? 
You know what I mean? You know, the, I mean, sales, for all you people who have worked and work in sales, God bless you, but it's just, it's really not my cup of tea to convince someone to do anything, let alone convince them to trust their eternity. And, you know, it's like, if that was up to me, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty rough, rough deal. But we're messengers, amen? And the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts and transforms us. And then last, we're called to be those messengers. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus, and then we have to testify of Jesus. We have to be obedient, Matthew 28. We have to go into all the world, all tribes, peoples. Every knee is going to bow, right? Every tongue is going to confess. But how will they know unless someone tells them? Amen? So it's our job to be those messengers. And today... We're going to be in John 16. We're actually going to keep going. And my message this morning is called Handling Offense. I wanted to bring out like a section of a pickup picket fence or something and, and, and handle it, but um, sorry. Boo. Um, <laughs> but... but uh, yeah, don't throw any tomatoes, please. We don't want to shampoo the carpet. Um, but essentially, we're talking about handling offense. Jesus, you know, Jesus, if, if you've, we've, as we've been going through the last several verses, John uh, chapter 15, verses 18 through 27 is what we've been going through so far. Keep in mind, what did Jesus say? Keep in mind, if the world hates you, it hated me first. Jesus has been talking about a lot of heavy stuff some pretty tough topics and issues that the disciples are going to face, and now we're going to talk about handling offense. So if you have your Bibles, let's read John chapter 16. We're going to read four verses, John chapter 16, starting in verse 1. And again, like we say, bring your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there's a free Bible out there in one of the coves that you can take home with you today. Um, we want you to have your Bibles. We want to be students of the Word. The river, we believe at the River Church that we are a place to know and love God and grow and love people. You know, and all those things happen in the context of, of community and of knowing the Word of God. Amen? If you don't know the Word, again, Romans 15, or Romans, excuse me, Romans chapter 10, just like we said, how will they know? How will you know unless someone tells them? And how will we know unless we're reading it? Amen? So I would encourage you, read the word. John chapter 16, verse 1. Let's go. It says, All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. You will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. Next verse. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we just come before you. We are so grateful, Holy Spirit, for your presence in this place. We acknowledge you as God, Lord. And we ask that you would move upon our hearts this morning. God, we know that there are so many opportunities uh, to be offended. <laughs> Luke 17, 1 sends, says that opportunities for stumbling are inevitable. But Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. God, that we would hear from you. Lord, that we would look to your word and that you would open the eyes and ears of our hearts uh, to see and hear what you're speaking to us, Lord. Father, I pray that by your grace that we would bear fruit that lasts today. God, plant the seeds in our heart, Lord, that we would walk in forgiveness, that we would walk in repentance, that we would walk in love, Lord, that we would walk in patience. Help us to follow after you each and every day, fresh and new. Lord, we thank you that your mercy is new every morning. Father, we receive that mercy now. Give us eyes to see. Lord, help me to divide your word. Help me to properly preach and anoint me 
to speak your words this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, there is no shortage of things to be offended about in our day and age. Right? I guarantee you, with 100% accurately, accuracy, excuse me, someone can find something to be upset about. Right? It's really quiet. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you know, you just turn on the TV, turn on your phone, look at a newspaper, look at a magazine. I mean, it doesn't look at your social media. <laughs> Hopefully not your social media. Um, right? Um, but there are entire industries that make their living out of getting a rise out of people. Right? And guys, let's be honest this morning that we're talking, we're talking left, right, and center here. Right? Where the whole point, there's, there is an outrage culture. And <laughs> suddenly, everybody got a keyboard and turned into a warrior and just wages war on what upsets them. Or you go to, you know, I heard somebody, I won't, I won't. I heard about somebody that, <laughs> that they got a, a poor deal at, at a store. And so they went back and they just got upset and gave the person a really hard time. And then they came back and bragged about how they, were <laughs> they got such a great deal because they, uh, you know, gave the person a hard time. You know what? It's not that hard to find something to be upset about. But does that make it right? You know, is that what Christ would have us live like? That we just are looking for and stepping on landmines of offense each and every day? You know, is that the, you know, uh, is that the type of content that you really want to be consuming? When the Word tells us to meditate on God's perfect Word, that which is good, pleasing, perfect, excellent, think on these things. You know, if we're supposed to have the Word of God filling our hearts and minds day and night, like, like God told Joshua, you know, if it's supposed to transform our minds, if it's supposed to renew us, should we have that in our diet or outrage culture in our diet? Because seeds turn into fruit, right? And what you behold, you will become. And without even getting into our message, it, it is just wise advice. Sometimes you just need to turn it off, <laughs> right? And, and get your life back a little bit. And it doesn't mean be ignorant of things going on. It doesn't mean don't have an opinion and don't care about things that are actually really important. But what are you consuming? Because you are what you eat. You know? Amen. <laughs> you know, but whether we're talking about legitimate issues or petty things or deep wounds and betrayal, how we handle offenses is very important, right? Right? Not dealing with offenses can create resentments and deep roots of bitterness. It can create an atmosphere of hatred and hostility and tension. It can reinforce a sense of distrust, suspicion, misunderstanding, withholding forgiveness, hardening your heart, grieving the Holy Spirit, and the list goes on and on and on when we fail to handle offenses properly. Right? And this is, this is inside... And outside the church. This is inside and outside your family. This is inside and outside your marriage or your relationships. Will you choose to ha handle offense well and biblically, or will you eat every single seed thrown your way? Right? 
So we're going to talk about that this morning because we need to understand that there are real impacts and consequences, both positive and negative, regarding how we handle offense when it comes. And today, I want to look at, I want to look at how offense can break relationships, it can cloud our vision, but because it's inevitable, God's desire is that we would handle it well and not fall away, not stumble. So, my first point this morning is that offense breaks relationship. Verse 1 in our passage talks about, it says, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. You know, we've referenced this verse a few times in the last couple sermons because it's so significant that this is, you know, this is our key verse. And it contains our key word uh, this morning. But it's so significant because what is, what is Jesus saying here? All of this I have told you so that. I mean, when you see something like, therefore, so that, because of, in as much, with some of your translations, you know, you need to pay attention to those types of things when you see them in the Word because God is saying, pay attention. Right? All these things, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. So we can deduce just that by this one verse that everything that really came before this is really important because it impacts whether or not we will fall away. And I mean, when we're talking about being disciples of Christ, what has Jesus called us to do? Deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him, right? To fall away from that is pretty much the worst thing that, we could, that could possibly happen, right? So you have, I mean, this should be in a neon sign when we read this. Most of your Bibles, many of your Bibles, it's in red letters. But underline that, underline that verse in your Bible. All these things I have told you so that you will not fall away. What did he tell us? He told us in verses 18 through 27, right after we talked about life in the vine, and it even applies to that in John 15, but he's basically saying, if the world hates you, it hated me first. The world's going to hate you. That's not great, but he's being real, right? If you're... It, it says in that you're not of this world. He said that we are his representatives. We're the messengers. We're the ones bringing good news, right? He's talking about knowing the Father and whether or not the people believe the miracles of God. And he's, you know, in, in other verses directly talking about this, Jesus is saying, if I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me, Right? He's talking about being authentic and providing proof that he is who he says he is. The amazing thing about Christianity and following Jesus is that it's true. Right? It's not just subjective feeling. I mean, there is more evidence to the life, the, the, the physical life of Christ than any other person on the face of the earth that has ever existed. The only other, and strangely enough, I, I don't know how this was calculated, but the, the next person that, ha, that has been more, most significant and has most written about them is Martin Luther because of the geopolitical religious impact that he had in the world at that time. But besides Martin Luther, which that'll preach, um, Jesus Christ is the most documented person to ever live. Ever. You know, and that's not even what makes it true. That's just icing on the cake, right? Jesus is very serious about us living with a confidence of our salvation, with a confidence that he is who he says he is, and we can take that check to the bank and cash it. Amen? 
So when we see things like this, it is all the more important because he's saying, listen, he talked about the advocate, the Holy Spirit being sent from the Father. So all of this, all of this was so that we would not fall away. Bless you. But what is that word fall away? That's our key word this morning. Fall away. And actually, that you, no, 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 it, it, you will fall away is one word. And then not is like the, it's like necessary, unnecessary. So this is one word. You will fall away. You will not fall away. And it is, the Greek word is scandalizo. Scandalizo. To fall away is to scandalizo. It's to cause to sin. Listen, it's to make someone stumble. It's to fall away. We get the word scandal or scandalous from this word. Um, but what it also means is scandalizo means to take an offense, to become offended, or to offend somebody else. We're talking about handling offense this morning. Handling offense. What makes scandalizo so scandalous is that whether it's stumbling into sin, falling away, abandoning your faith, or taking on an offense, it all breaks relationship. It all breaks the relationship. Look at the story of Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter 4, you see this story where Cain and Abel both bring a sacrifice to God. And it says in verse 3, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. You know, we just talked about tithing this morning. It's the principle of the first fruits. Before there was any, there, before Abraham, before there was the law, before anything else, the, the better sacrifice was the first fruits. Right? Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of his firstborn lamb from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, uh, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This, is made, this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its masters. Keep it right here on verse 7. Go back to verse 7. <clears throat> you have this situation where Abel brought a better sacrifice because it was a sacrifice that cost him. And that's the principle of the first fruits. It's, it's, it's a sacrifice that costs us. It's the first fruits. It's the best fruits. It's the before anything else fruits. Right? Um... It says in verse 3, or excuse me, verse 4, I think, that Cain just brought some, some of his crops. He just brought some of his crops. Um, actually, go back to that. Uh, verse 4. Go back one more time. Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord, but Abel brought a gift, the best of the, of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gifts. So, this all happened. You got two brothers, the first brothers. I mean, talk about brotherly affection. Um, and God accepts Abel, he rejects Cain, and Cain goes away angry and dejected. And pay attention to that angry and dejected. Now, go to verse 8, because this is the fruit of. Of offense in someone's life. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The first murder. It's the fruit of offense in someone's life. 
And you might be sitting here this morning, and you're saying, oh, I never killed anybody. Back off. <laughs> Let me be upset. Right? But it doesn't work like that. Because Jesus even said, if we have hatred in our heart towards our brother, we're already guilty of committing murder. Right? This is the fruit of offense. It's the doctrine of demons. It is envy at its core. It's what put Jesus on the cross and filled the hearts of the Pharisees as they beat him, scourged him, and hung him to die. Or at least accused him so the Romans could. Right? It's the fruitful end of offense. And it started with some anger and some dejection. Has anybody been there? If we're honest... You get angry about something, and you get disappointed. You get dejected. And, and the Bible actually says his countenance fell, that his face fell. Like, man, what? The thing is, that is a seed. It's a seed in our hearts. And if we don't pluck that out of there and handle offense well, we will end up letting it grow in our hearts. It was never dealt with, and it caused Cain to fall into sin, to be scandalized. Right? It's the first, it's the second, <laughs> it's the second scandal of all history that a brother killed his brother. Offenses can happen when there's a sense of being wronged. And you know what? There are plenty of legitimate things that have been done to us that were wrong, right? There are plenty of legitimate offenses where people have indeed sinned against us. But you know what? There are also probably a few things where we've sinned against others, right? Today? This morning? Offenses can happen when there's a sense of being wronged. Trust is broken. Someone sinned against you. Even unmet expectations can lead to offense. Well, this is not how this was supposed to go, right? It's always damaging to the relationship. It always creates separation. Jesus in our passage is telling the disciples, all these things ahead of time because he wants to what? He wants to maintain relationship with the disciples, right? He does not want the disciples to have all these bad things that he's saying, hey, this is going to happen. He, when these things end up happening, he doesn't want the disciples to burn out and check out because they're offended of their circumstances of legitimate things people have done against them, Right? And that's why what Jesus is saying is so important because the disciples are about to go through some tough stuff, right? He, do, he doesn't want his disciples to become offended and fall away, to be scandalized. You know what's also interesting, especially when it comes to this Cain and Abel story? It says Cain was angry and dejected. But at who? Yes. Do you think about that? Who's Cain angry with? God? Abel? Dejected? What does that communicate? He's pretty, feeling pretty sorry for himself. Everyone? The world? You know? All five of them? Right? My parents don't understand me. Um, I don't think he was a teenager. But, um, you know, obviously he's mad at Abel, right? He killed him. That's a good indicator. But when, you know, and I don't have it up there, but verse 9, God comes 
And he's asking about, where's your brother? And what does Cain say? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Like, dude, watch your attitude. Like you're talking to Yahweh, the creator and breather of the stars. You know? But he was angry at Abel. He was angry at God. He was feeling sorry for himself. Offense breaks relationships. Listen, you being mad at that person for that thing, although might be legitimate, it breaks relationships. It's hurting you. It's hurting them. It's hurting your relationship with God. Do you ever have something happen where, you know, oftentimes situations will happen and someone will mistreat us and we get mad at them and we get mad at God? Why'd you let this happen, God? I thought you were supposed to be, like, you know, in control of everything, you know? Like, ask Job about how he felt, you know? Job had to navigate his feelings towards God. Right? He's saying, I'm a righteous man. I didn't do anything. And you know what? That's true. That was true. Right? But we have to grapple these things because it's going to happen. All these things I've told you. So that. Right? So... We have these situations where it's exactly what Jesus is walking his disciples through. He's saying there is stuff coming. And I want to tell you ahead of time. Because I don't want you to break relationship. And you know what is amazing? When it hit the fan, they all left. They broke relationship. One guy ran away naked because they grabbed him and his clothes fell off you know what i mean it's like god knows that we're going to go through these things and he knows sometimes we're going to blow it but he wants to communicate with us ahead of time i am committed to committing to this relationship timothy talks about if god If we are faithless, God remains faithful because he can't deny himself. That's who God is. He is faithful. And it's, you know, sometimes we read that kind of like a coffee cup scripture. It's like, oh, if I'm just faithless, you're faithful. No, 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 no. Like, if we're faithless, we have no faith. Like, not just like, I'm trying, Lord. But like, no, if we are God, nah. Right? And both are true. The man who said, I believe, help my unbelief, God is faithful to him. And you know, the people that say, I'm done. Thankfully, like the prodigal son, God is faithful to that person too. Amen? Because he's committed to maintaining the relationship. He desires for us to know him. He desires for us to walk with him. He desires for us to be transformed by him. And offense breaks those relationships. What offenses in your life have you let break apart relationships? Oh, oh, oh. uh A lot of people clearing their throats. Look at the time, look at the time. And where do you need to make things right? Right? Because it's not just hurting them. Unforgiveness hurts you. It is, it is, I mean, you can, you can look at, you can look at observable evidence that people that are full of bitterness and unforgiveness are even physically more unhealthy. Isn't that crazy? That, that for unforgiveness and bitterness and deep roots of offense physically impacts your body. There is no coincidence that David himself said, my sin 
is like a cancer in my bones. You know, because, and it's the mercy of God to let it eat us a little bit, right? Because if we were just comfortable, you know, there, there, you know, something that we say a lot is be led by God's peace. I think that's, that's good and that's accurate. But you know what? Jonah had a lot of peace sleeping in that boat in complete rebellion against God, running across the world in the opposite direction from where he was supposed to go, right? He's just like, this is fine. This is fine. I'm having a good nap. Don't even feel bad. You know what? It's the mercy of God that sometimes we get thrown off the boat and swallowed by a fish. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's the mercy of God that our circumstances go wonky and we're like, what have I done? Because it's God's grace to, it's his love and his kindness that brings us to repentance. Amen? Because he knows it's a cancer in your bones. He knows you're miserable. He knows you're miserable hating that person. But it feels good because they deserve it. Right? But it's like sugar. Feels good, and then you feel terrible. And then you got to get some more sugar, and then you feel good, and then you feel terrible. And you just got to keep on hating more and more people. And now I watch the news, and I hate this guy, and I hate that guy, because that guy reminds me of that guy, and that guy reminds me of my dad. My dad's a jerk. You know what I mean? Hey. You don't have to raise your hand. But I know I'm not preaching to no one. You know? Number two. Offense clouds our vision. Go figure. You know, what does it say? They will put you out of the synagogue. This is a huge deal. We read this, we have no clue. We have no idea what that means. It's like, I'm not able to go to that church anymore. Big whoop. There's one across the street. I can just live stream. The synagogue was the, the hub of community. It was, it was where you went to school. It was where your legal stuff got worked out. It was where you would go to hang out like a community center. It was where, I mean, it was where you would get married. It was, it was, it was the hub. It was your heritage. It was your Jewishness. You went to the synagogue. Yes, you'd go to the, the, the temple for the big feasts and the stuff, but everything else you were at the synagogue. So when you get expelled from the synagogue, and this whole sentence is one word, and it basically means to be excommunicated from a synagogue. It's a big, big deal. If someone said to you, you will be completely ostracized from your heritage, your people, your community, your school, your, your legal connections, your community connections, your whole life is over. We'd be like, that's a big deal. And this is what Jesus is saying. They're going to do that to you. Don't get offended. Man. In fact, the time is coming, and it gets worse. They're going to kill you. They're going to kill you, and they think they're doing a service to God. But you know what? <clears throat> the Jews, who would soon, per soon persecute the disciples, thought they were so justified in thinking that they were serving God by killing Christians. But verse 3 says, th Jesus makes it clear, they're going to do these things because they have no idea who God is. So they think they're serving God, but offense, envy, this jealousy, this Cain spirit has filled their hearts and their vision is clouded. clouded. They have no idea who God even is. Why? Why? Because offense messes with the way you see the world. 
You know, we were just talking about it. I don't like this guy because he reminds me of that person. Do you realize that is a lens that you're seeing the world through? And, and the more we don't, we don't go to God with our hurts and hang-ups and habits and, and things like that, the more we let those deep-seated offense and wounds be the sunglasses that we see life through. It's our worldview. And we see all, you know, all men as pigs and all these guys as terrible and all, all those people as terrible and all this, you know, and I can't trust these people and I can't trust those people and this group of people I'm, you know, prejudiced against. And this, it's like, do you realize that you have created lenses for you to see the world through? Because offense clouds our vision. Jesus was their Messiah. Like, he's the guy that they've been waiting for. And they wanted to kill him. Because why? Envy, offense. And you know where it all started? One of the areas it started was when Jesus was talking about, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. To the Jews, that was like, Yuck. Dude, that's no. No, no. And it says many people left. And Jesus said, and it actually uses this word, scandalizo. It was a scandalous stumbling block for people. They couldn't get past it, it offended people. And we see that as in the cross, we see that in communion, we see that as we take part of the sacrifice of Christ and in his resurrection. But Jesus turned to his disciples and said, are you going to leave too? And they had a choice. They had a choice. Am I, I going to be offended? Or am I going to navigate this and keep following Jesus? Right? Sometimes Christ, through his word, confronts us with things. And we have an opportunity to go, I can either check out or I can navigate through this. Don't break relationship. Don't break relationship. Offense clouds our vision. You know, have you ever been offended and then talk to that person and find out it was a complete misunderstanding? You've already got your jump to conclusions mat out and you're like, they're a jerk! Like, <laughs> but it's like you talk to them and they're like, no, I was just hungry. I, no, I'm sorry. I, I love you. It was totally, totally mistake. You know, I had a conversation like that recently. It was like, whoa, I am sorry. That is not anywhere even close to what I meant. Like, I'm sorry. And we got to work it out. Right? But if you don't, you go through life with those glasses. I used to, I used to need, I need glasses, obviously. I used to need, I need glasses actively. And for years of my life, I'd walk around like this. And it's true. And I'd walk around like this. And my wife, bless her heart, like 12 years ago was like, honey, you need glasses. I'm like, why? <laughs> She's like, because you look mean. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I was permanently squinting because I couldn't see. And you know what? It was just a misunderstanding. But you got to have the right lenses to see things properly, right? We get angry. We get nervous. We get anxious. We need to figure it out. We need to get to the root of it. This happened with John the Baptist. And this, listen, listen to this story. Go to, go to this, this, this passage. Matthew 11. Now when John, while imprisoned, he's in prison. He's going to die here. 
he heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, the Messiah, or shall we look for someone else? Think about that. John the Baptist was one of the first people to publicly proclaim who Jesus was. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I mean, this guy was bold. This guy proclaimed the gospel. He was fearless in the face of the Pharisees. And now he's in prison. Now his world is crumbling. And now he's wondering, are you the one? His vision was clouded. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Go to the next verse. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Blessed is he who does not scandalizo at me. Don't let offense cloud your vision. Don't let offense. And what is it? Go back one verse. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report what you hear and see. Sometimes when our vision is so clouded, we need to go back to the Word and see the faithfulness of God. We need to hear what God says. You know what? All those amazing things that happened did not immediately impact John in prison. But it was the encouragement that he needed to know that God is faithful and he makes good on his promises. Amen? Because he would have been a student of the word, and he would, all these bold things, this is Old Testament references. In my translation, that's what it does. You know, John would have known exactly what was going on. But you've got to get your vision straight. Amen? Third thing, offense will happen. Everybody say it with me. Offense will happen. When? To you? No. Right? <laughs> yeah, God is good all the time. All the time. People offend me all the time. All right. <laughs> Verse 4, I have told you this. Again, pay attention to that. I've told you this so that when their time comes to you, you will remember what I warned you about them. What is this? When their time comes, when they're going to expel you from the synagogue and kill you. Not the greatest time, but it's coming. You will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. When their time comes, offense will absolutely come. Okay? Okay? Luke 17, verse 1, says it is inevitable that stumbling blocks will come. One, a couple of translations say offenses will come. Uh, 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 people will sin against you. It, it says it's inevitable. It is guaranteed. It is guaranteed to happen. People are going to sin against you, right? Everybody say guaranteed. So we're not going to be surprised when someone sins against us, right? Because it is guaranteed. <laughs> it's not funny, but you know, sometimes we live like it's not true. Right? And we're so surprised. We're like, <gasps> you know, and there are some really serious things that, that have happened to us. It's not a joke. But let's not live in a fantasy world, right? Let's be equipped so that we will not be offended. When it does happen, we will be able to handle it well and not question the character of God, right? 
The, the goal is that we would be able to handle it well and not question the character of God. Look at another thing Jesus said in this very chapter. Verse 33. I have told you these things. Everybody say this. So that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, Jesus overcoming the world doesn't mean trouble won't happen. It means he's given us the tools and he's committed to walk us through that trouble. God doesn't remove us from suffering. He gives us the perspective and the companionship to navigate through it. Jesus himself went out into the wilderness by the Spirit and suffered. He suffered. He fasted for 40 days. It says he was hungry. And you know what? He didn't pray to God to bust in like Superman and take him out of that situation. Right? He went to the Word. He maintained his faith. He said, I'm going to navigate this well, right? And not get offended. Not fall away. Not give in to Satan. He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. It's like he over and over and over, he went to Scripture. He did not give the enemy a foothold to cause him to stumble. Amen? He endured suffering. What should we do? What should we do? Two things that we should do when it comes to handling offense well. And this is my, my closing thought. The first thing is we need to repent when we offend others. You have to repent. When you sin, you have to repent. We've sinned against God and man. You know, when we harm others, we need to repent and make it right. Matthew 5, 23, 24. It says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, Leave. Right? Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. God wants us to repent when we offend others. Right? When we sin against others, we need to make things right. And that first starts by repentance. God, I'm sorry. Repent means to turn, turn around. It means to change your mind. It means if you're going this way, you say, I'm taking responsibility for this. I have done this. I've lived this way. I've walked this way. This is my fault. But for the grace of God and the blood that was shed for me, I reject this, and I put my faith in Christ, and I will walk this way and serve him and love him. You must replace wickedness with righteousness. We are not meant to live an abstaining from sin lifestyle and not live a righteous life. It doesn't work. You can't not do bad things and not replace it with something else. We're meant to follow after Christ every day. The second thing is strive for reconciliation. Strive for reconciliation. Matthew 18, 15. And I would just encourage all all of you to read Matthew 18, especially this principle, because it walks you through exactly what you should do, step by step. It's like a manual. And if more people would do this, we would have a lot less less strifes and offenses in our families, in our churches, in our communities, right? It says, moreover, if your brother or sister sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Don't post it on social media. Hey, that Bart guy is a jerk. Um, Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't complain. Talk to them. And you know what? If, If that person, if you are in a situation where you can't talk to that person about the reason you're so offended at them, turn off your phone. Right? Most of the time, we have so many borrowed offenses. Like, 
I don't even know why I'm supposed to be mad at this guy who lives in California, but I hate him because I know about him, right? Like, just forget it, man. Leave him in California. He doesn't impact your life. If your brother sins against you, go to them alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. The goal is restoration, right? The goal is that you gain not just a, a, an appeased person. The goal is that you gain a brother, right? Strive for reconciliation. It takes forgiveness, amen? It takes forgiveness. Proverbs 17, 9, it's not up there, but it says, He who covers an offense promotes love but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Christ demonstrated his love for us. Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He extended his forgiveness while we were yet sinners. There are people that have legitimately and seriously offended and sinned against some people in this room. Maybe you've mis been mistreated. Maybe you've been assaulted. Maybe, who knows? But forgiveness is the only way to be free. Because forgiveness is the only way that we are free. And Christ lavished that love upon us. Like I said, offense breaks relationships. It not only impacts that person, it impacts how you see God, and it impacts you. And some, some of us are in situations so painful that we wouldn't even be able to give a genuine prayer out of our mouth. But you know what? Start with just saying the words. I forgive that person. I bless that person. I ask that you would release that person, Lord, because I know that you desire to heal my heart. He's the healer of the brokenhearted. Amen? Let's stand and pray. You know, there are always people up here to pray with you. Um, and after the service, I'll be up here, and I would love to pray with you. Um, but if God's tugging on your heart, and there are some people in your life that you've offended, that you've sinned against, or that have sinned against you, and you want help walking through that to forgive them, to repent, to be set free from that. We want to pray with you. So after the service, after we pray, I would just invite you, if that's you, I'd like you to come forward after we pray. And we want to pray with you because God has so much more for you than to live a life of bitterness and contempt because it leaches into every area of our lives. Amen? How we handle offense is so important. Lord, we come before you and we thank you that you desire to maintain relationship with us. God, it's not your will that one should perish, but for all to know Christ. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to your goodness. Let us see and hear of who you are that you're the God who heals the brokenhearted. Lord, when you were offended, when we were your enemies, you died for us. You extended your grace and mercy. You forgave us. Lord, we receive that gift. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the price that you paid for us. Lord, to give us, um, to pay the debt <laughs> we couldn't pay to give us the gift we couldn't earn. 
everlasting life. Lord, we thank you for your power. Lord, we thank you that you do not give up on us. Lord, I pray all this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. If that's you and you want prayer, please come forward.